Today I will be telling you about four murder stories that happened in Park County, but I chose them that happened close to Summit County. And uh, so the phrase over the range was a term used in the 1800s when miners or travelers described going from one, say, mountain pass over to another or over a mountain range, and they would say they went over the range. And it was also used in some of the obituaries um, to describe someone's final passing. They would say he went over the range. So. <laughs> So uh, my book, South Park Perils, is somewhat similar to uh, Mary Ellen Gilliland's uh, Rascal Scoundrels and No Goods, but I am in no way comparing myself to her because she is a wonderful, prolific author who has written, I think, 20 books about Summit County, but similar stories, so I just wanted to let you know. Stories I'll be telling you about today happened uh, near these three passes, which are Webster, Georgia, and Boreas. Has anyone been over those four-wheeled or driven? Boreas is drivable, certainly in a car. Um, Georgia Pass, it's not too bad. Webster Pass, not so bad, except right near the top, I've been told. I have not been over that one. So, And on the left there is uh, Park County, which adjoins Summit and seven other counties, and then here, um, I'm showing you where they are in relation to um, where the towns are. So Boreas Pass is near Como, Georgia Pass near Jefferson, and then Webster Pass is near Hall Valley, which there is no town there anymore, but there was, and I'll be going into quite a bit of history about Hall Valley. So you will meet the likes of Ella Coons Valley up there. Whoops. Um, the only, only two women were charged with murder in Park County in the 1800s and both were acquitted. But this is a rare photo of her in the Arapaho County Jail, which later became the Denver County Jail. And um, this, whoops, <laughs> I did the wrong button. Uh, this is Levi Streeter, Charles Baker. Charles Baker and Ella Valley were supposedly having a uh, little get-together from time to time. And uh, John Gallagher down here. So. so people ask, how in the world did I get interested in this? Well, would you believe I worked as a probation officer? <laughs> I know I don't look the part, but it was actually a great disguise. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I worked in Colorado Springs, and that's the courthouse down there in El Paso County. I worked for 22 years down there. And so I thought you'd uh, like to see some current mugshots. This is, I don't know this uh, inmate, but that's what the current mugshots look like. And the uniforms, as you can see, are green. And back in the 1800s, uh, they wore the proverbial stripes. <laughs> And this is my meanest looking um, uh, inmate that I have a story about. I, oh, I think, just think he looks scary. So <laughs> and after I took an early retirement, and then I uh, volunteered with the Park County Local History Archives. And I've been doing that for 10 years. I was president for seven, so I just resigned in January. And I actually live down near Littleton in the South Denver, so it's quite a drive for me to come up to Fair Play once a week. So I've cut back, but I'm doing quite a bit of volunteer work at home. So anyway, if you get a chance, please go on the Park County Archives website. We have about 3,600 photos online. So we've got quite a great collection. So the first story I'm going to tell you about is those Hall Valley Roughs, as they were called. What is a rough? Well, we were just talking about that. They're ne'er-do-wells. <laughs> They're the bad guys. And this is a <coughs> postcard from the Denver Public Library showing some of the antics that these bad guys would do in the mining towns. And uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was a rough time. And as you can see over here, Hall Valley, because it was so far away from Fair Play, the county seat, which is still the county seat, um, was called the grand resort of a great majority of unhung rascals. <laughs> so Hall Valley was pretty rough. 
And in fact, here's a list of what all was going on up in Hall Valley. And there were lynchings, there were accidental shootings, there was a shooting and a murder at a mine. I mean, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. So I'm telling you today about um, the one in green there, about Jacob Byard, who was a mining superintendent, and he shot one of his uh, minor employees in a saloon in the back. You know, you hear about this, getting shot in the back. He did. So, but first, a little history about Hall Valley, because it's one of my favorite places. Um, Hall Valley was named after Colonel Hall, as he liked to be called. He was actually a Brigadier General, but he preferred the name Colonel. And he was quite the decorated veteran. He served in the legislature. Um, he owned a number of mines at the top of Hall Valley, as well as a smelter there. And then he left town, some said, kind of in the middle of the night type thing, and <laughs> eventually moved to England. Now, Colonel Hall had a brother named Cassius Hall, or Cash. And, you know, I always have to wonder about how, how their mother would call those boys. I mean, the names are just kind of a mouthful, Jarrus and Cassius. <laughs> um, but the article in the middle there is about how the two went on a bear hunt near Gray's Peak. And they became snowblind. And Cash on the right there was actually snowblind for a couple days before his sight was recovered. So there's actually three levels to Hall Valley. And Hall Valley is, if you go to um, Keystone, Keystone Ski Resort, keep going up the road to Montezuma, the little mining town of Montezuma. Keep going, that's Webster Pass. Webster Pass will drop you down into the next gulch which is near Hall Valley. So at the bottom level, on the left, is a photo by William Henry Jackson, probably 1873 when he was in Colorado. And uh, on the right is one of my current photos. And then Middle Hall Valley is actually the Hall Valley campground now. It's five miles down uh, County Road 62, Park County, right at the base of Kenosha Pass. And as you can see, there was quite a settlement there at the time. And this is a close-up here of, I think, it's that white boarding house there. So a friend and I um, <laughs> tried to line, match up some rocks <laughs> one day. <laughs> no, we didn't have any luck. We were so anxious to try to find this original, you know, mining site, uh, town site, but we didn't have any luck. So. Um, and then when you do go up the Hall Valley Road, about five miles, you'll come to this sign. And so, as you can see, Webster Pass goes to the right, and Hall Valley uh, Campground is to the left. And what was up at the top? Well, a boarding house was there for the Whale Mine, which is this, I've got a photo of the mine now, uh, which was way up here. And I've been up there a number of times. Here's what that site looks like today where the boarding house was. There's just a bunch of rubble and rocks. There's really not much left. Same with the colored photo, just, you know, some debris and some wood window frames, and that's about it. But here's a photo of the whale up at the very, very top up there. It was a huge mine, had seven adits, and if you hike, whoops, if you hike, um, up here, Continental Divide, and you look down onto Summit County. So, here's another photo, and interestingly, Hall, Val Hall Valley is also the headwaters of the North Fork of the South Platte. So, life up at the top of Hall Valley. After Colonel Hall left, uh, a family, a man named Claude Street, bought the whale mine. And would you believe he and his family lived up there year-round, as these photos show, in the winter. And there's that uh, boarding house in the background. And I, I can't imagine life up there at 12,000 feet with the snow they get. <laughs> but they, you know, they made a life of it. So Now here's an interesting fellow who supposedly uh, actually discovered the whale mine back in the 1860s. And, uh, if you can read the caption down there, that's from our photo that we have in the archives. 
And uh, his name was Scott Shaw, who was uh, kind of an all-round trapper and uh, you know, guide, miner. And as you can see, he lost his, part of his left leg in the Civil War. But there he is up at the top of Hall Valley with his burrow. And Enos Mills was up there, believe it or not, uh, father of Rocky Mountain National Park. So it had some interesting visitors up at the top there. So the story about uh, the murder that happened is uh, probably happened in a, a, whoops, a saloon or a store, you know, similar to what I've got up here. So big, big Jake, Jake Byard was a mining superintendent, and he was in Campbell's Saloon one night, and one of his employees, Amos Brazil, was also in, and they began arguing over some very small little detail. Well, Big Jake went out, and Amos was up, leaning up at the bar, and Jake came back in and shot Amos right in the back as he leaned against the bar. Now, amazingly, I was able to find the original coroner reports on this murder, which were in the state archives in Denver. And so this is a handwritten version. I think this is by George Campbell himself. And so I've underlined there what uh, Amos said is he was dying. And he, so he goes, for God's sake, boys, he has killed me. And you know, it's all quite dramatic. <laughs> and poor Amos, he was a big man. And he fell to the floor and laid there. And they went for a doctor. But of course, in fair play, you know, it took hours to get a doctor out. So he died right there on the saloon floor. And this is the original uh, coroner's inquisition report showing that uh, Amos Brazil came to his death by the felonious intent of uh, Jacob Byard. So what happened to Big Jake? Well, he hid out in the Hall Valley smelter that night. He was not captured. And then he walked into Webster, a nearby town, the next morning. Two citizens recognized him. They deputized themselves, and they caught him, threw him in a wagon, and hauled him to the Park County Jail in Fairplay, which still stands. There it is. <laughs> but uh, Jake was a clever fellow, and the jailer allowed another inmate to play the fiddle at night. So while this guy was fiddling, Jake had found a metal file, and he was sawing to the time of the fiddle. True story. <laughs> I kid you not. And he sawed his way out of jail. So <laughs> he took off. He went up to Wyoming, um, supposedly to meet up with his father and brother. And from there, the trail goes cold. I could not find out what happened. There was supposed to be a big shootout in Buffalo, Wyoming. And I just, I could never, I could never find the uh, result. So that's, uh, that's Big Jake. And the guy who had hid the metal file in there, he was a cattle rustler uh, in Chaffee County. He ended up being lynched off of a bridge in Canyon City. So he didn't fare so well. His name was Ernest Christensen. And here's the courthouse where uh, Big Jake was supposed to go to trial. This is actually where I volunteer. The building has been um, renovated into offices. And uh, the archives office is in this little, through this little foyer there. And here's a photo of um, the prison in Canyon City where Big Jake was supposed to go. I'll be showing that a couple other times, too. So, but he never made it. Are those buildings still there in Canyon City, that prison? Uh, yeah, yeah. That is called um, Old Max, actually. Um, old Maximum Security. You know what? I missed, um, I was going to tell, oh, I did show you that about my, uh, card. Yeah, I've actually been in there, and um, yeah, it still stands. It is still used for low-level risk inmates. But they, I must say, they do have an excellent um, prison museum down there that was the women's uh, prison, and they've done a really good job with that. So, okay, so the second murder happened um, near Georgia Pass in the little town of Jefferson. That depot still stands. 
So this story involves a rancher named Uplide Valley. He was from Canada. And his, he had a beautiful ranch right behind the depot. And so when he was done, he worked as a ticket agent in the Jefferson Depot. So at night, he could just leave the depot, walk across his fields there, and go home. Well, and this is a sketch of the interior of his house. One night, he was uh, bludgeoned to death with a, a big wooden stick or a cane. And uh, so the suspect, which I'll get to in a minute, <laughs> but here's what the uh, depot looks like today. <coughs> and here's uh, the depot in use. Now, this is the conductor, I assume, trying to get people to board the train, but Mr. Valley would have worked right inside there in that depot. So here is Charles Baker, the suspect. And Mr. Baker was a ranch hand for Uplide Valley. And here is, whoops, here is um, Mr. Valley's wife, Ella Coons Valley. And as I said, she was supposedly having an affair with Charles Baker. So everyone thought the two had been in cahoots, you know, to, to murder Mr. Valley. Well, it was quite the scandal back then to have a woman um, charged in a murder. So these were Denver headlines. Um, it was quite the big deal. <laughs> and so Ella was um, confined. This was the old Denver, well, Arapahoe County Jail, but it was in Denver. Uh, Denver didn't become a county until the following year, 1902. So Ella was uh, allowed to travel to Denver, supposedly to go to her husband's funeral, but instead she was arrested. And she was quite dramatic. She threw herself on the coffin and was sobbing and crying. And oh, she was, <laughs> she was the drama queen. <laughs> and her husband is very buried in Fairmount in uh, Denver. Now I found, just by chance, I found these photos of, uh, a woman called Unidentified Woman. These are Denver Public Library photos. And what do you think? I think it's her. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, with that pointed chin and that haircut. And yeah, I just, yeah. I, exactly, exactly. And, and she was described as being very moody and attention getting. And so to me, it just all seemed to fit. Anyway. <laughs> So here's a photo of Charles Baker, his mugshot on the left, and then I found these photos on the right of him um, on a, like an Ancestry uh, website. So Charles Baker uh, went to trial in that courthouse in Fair Play, and he was convicted. He served, hmm, I don't know, I can't remember offhand, maybe 16 years. He paroled. He went to Wyoming and is buried in Michigan. So. <laughs> okay, my last two stories are about two murders in Como, which is near Boreas Pass. Now, Como was a railroad hub, and it literally sprang up almost overnight in 1879. It was, uh, as you can see by the title of this article, a tented town. Um, you know, tents were put up, all the railroad freight after the tracks were laid, of course, was unloaded there. It was, it was a, a big uh, freighting operation there. And unfortunately, some of the railroad workers were pretty rough. So the first story I'll tell you about, I call Fishing for Trouble. <laughs> and this building still stands in Como. This was Montag Saloon. And here's our culprit, again, in stripes. Mr. John Gallagher. So Gallagher got into a fight one afternoon with uh, another railroad worker in front of the roundhouse there. And the victim's name was Martin O'Gorman. Well, Martin beat up John here pretty bad. So John went to the doctor, and he had a big bandage around his head. And he was limping along. And he decided to uh, go to Montag's saloon and lay in wait for Martin when Martin came out of the saloon drunk one night. And sure enough, Martin came out, John chased him with this piece of rail called a fish plate. 
which attaches the two tracks together. It's about 12 inches long. And so Gallagher chased uh, Martin, hit him over the head, crushed his skull, killed him. So <laughs> um, Gallagher went to prison. But first, he went to trial in the Fair Play Courthouse, but not before he tried to escape twice, the first time on the 4th of July. <laughs> I guess the word freedom, you know, meant quite a bit to him. But <laughs> he was captured uh, almost right away and put back in jail. And uh, he did go to prison. He was released, I think, after about eight years on a pardon. He was the oldest inmate at the time in Colorado prison, and he was only 51, but he was the oldest one. So. And then my last story is about the town cobbler, Mr. Levi Streeter, and he killed the town marshal. This is quite a complicated story. <laughs> um, one of the engineers, let's see, Sam Spies, I think he's in the middle there. There's an uh, enlargement of him, it's a little blurry. Anyway, Sam Spies was an engineer who lived in Como, and Sam was married to a young woman named Anna Blythe. And Anna got a little bored when her husband was uh, traveling on the train all the time, and she had a friend named Lillian Kennedy. Well, Lillian and Anna, one evening, were over at Levi Streeter's house, where he also had his cobbler business, and they were in the back room uh, with a couple other people having a party. And the town marshal came over because the party was getting a little too loud. Well, Lillian and Anna bailed out the back window, broke the window out, cut themselves. But unfortunately, when, oh, this is, um, that's where Anna lived with her husband, Sam. Unfortunately, um, when the marshal knocked on uh, Levi's front door, Levi answered it with a shotgun and shot the marshal dead right at the doorstep several times, and the marshal fell in, his, you know, the toe of his boot still in the, in the sill of the doorway there. Now, Anna and Sam had had quite a tragedy because they lost three infant children, probably to, you know, the various illnesses that happened in the 1800s, and all three children are buried there in the Como Cemetery. So um, that was, of course, definitely a tragedy in their lives. And Sam's granddaughter, Margaret Cole, who you may know is a, another author, uh, has written a great book called Going Railroading uh, about Sam. So this is a map I was able to find at the Park County Courthouse showing, it's what we call an evidence map, showing exactly the trajectory of the bullets and you can see where they came from there. Um, there, and then the bullets all went out like that. So during um, Anna's testimony in court, this is kind of that, I don't know nothing. And if you can read that briefly. She didn't know anything. She didn't see anything. She didn't hear anything. She didn't do anything. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, she wasn't very helpful, but like I said, she had her charges dismissed. And uh, Marshall Cook, I'm not quite sure, I think he's buried in Denver, but it was just about, I think, seven years ago, uh, the lady who uh, was the executive director of the South Park National Heritage Area nominated uh, Marshall Cook to go into the National Law Enforcement Memorial for Fallen Officers, and he was inducted, which is really cool. So I don't, I don't have a photo, of course, of his badge, but I, I found a couple of uh, photos of other town marshal badges online. So that's probably what his badge looked like. That one's from Laramie, Wyoming, and Bisbee, and just kind of a general idea. So. And what happened to Levi Streeter? Well, he went to prison. He was only there about two years, and he died in prison from consumption, which was tuberculosis. 
So he only served about two years. Um, now this is a fascinating place, if you like cemeteries, which I do. <laughs> um, this is a section of the Greenwood Cemetery in Canyon City, and they call this Woodpecker Hill. And how depressing, these are all DOC, Department of Corrections, inmates markers. And they do have a list of names of who's buried there, but I don't think they have a name with a corresponding gravesite. So this is, um, I'll show you a close-up, that's what the markers look like, just, you know. But I believe that cemetery was recently put on the National Historic Register, so. Um, Mr. Streeter is not buried there, according to the records, so he must have had family that came and got the body and, um, you know, buried him elsewhere, because I, I checked. But pretty depressing uh, place. So if you're interested, I have my book for sale, South Park Perils. I have a total of 34 stories. I was telling some people who came in early. One of our stories uh, over in Fair Play is about the uh, gentleman who was hung out the courthouse window. He was lynched out the courthouse window. True story. Courthouse still stands. <laughs> so it was, it was wild times back then, I think, for all of the surrounding area. And then... Um, our archives also did um, one of these Arcadia books, like uh, this one, on Park County. <coughs> and then I have a little um, cemetery book that I did about the Buckskin Joe Cemetery, which is behind Alma. Um, so I'll be happy to take questions or comments or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not, it's, a, I guess, a kind of a name for a traditional plot. But yeah, the, sci the markers are all must be metal and that's why they're so rusted, which he says, yes. No, but in the, um, in the office of the museum, the prison museum, they do have a list of all the inmates who are buried there, but like I said, I don't think they can match up a plot to a specific name. So, yeah. Well, it would have been by wagon or horseback. I think it was about three days. So, yeah, it was quite a journey from Fair Play to Alma is seven miles, and so that was about a three-hour walk, I think. Just, you know, almost half a day just to walk in between those two little mining towns. So, in Canyon City, oh, probably about the same distance, I guess, if you go down to Guffey and then go down that way to Canyon. So, yeah, it was, it was quite a haul. Yes. Well, I have a, a dear friend who wrote a book about Fair Play, um, and unfortunately she passed away last summer, but she, in her book, which is by the History Press, she has three different versions of the naming, but I think the most popular one is that, um, <laughs> we were just talking about <laughs> Terriol. Well, the area right near the Como Cemetery was originally called Hamilton, right across the way was called Terriol, although originally it was called Grab All because people were grabbing up mining claims unfairly. Terry All then was changed, uh, became the name Terry All, um, to Terry or linger a while in that spot in mine. So, <coughs> excuse me, some of the miners went over uh, down the road a ways where they said they could get fair play with their mining claims and have them properly recorded and registered. And so that's, yeah, that's how it got its name. Which stuck. And Fair Play, as I said, is the county seat, but originally, um, I think Terriol was the county seat. No, Buckskin Joe was first, then Terriol, then Fair Play. So, if you yeah. Have one, share with us your favorite murder. Oh, my favorite murder? <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, there's, there's so many. Unfortunately, how sad I could write a whole book about murders. I mean, I don't have any armed robberies. I don't have any burglaries or robberies. You know, I don't have any he done or wrong. I've just got murders. Um, I, you know, I, I guess the most dramatic one is that lynching out the courthouse window. Um, the man's name was John Hoover. He actually mined over in Leadville, and then he came over the range. <laughs> set up shop in Fair Play, and he owned um, a saloon and billiard hall and a cigar shop, all combined in one. 
Well, he um, had a neighbor, and the neighbor had hired a man to clean out a water ditch, a very benign, you know, activity one afternoon. Well, the guy cleaning out the ditch, um, he left the water all stopped up in the ditch, and it started flooding onto Hoover's property. And so the guy, that's embarrassing, I can't remember the guy's name who was <laughs> cleaning out the ditch. But he went over to the Fair Play Hotel, which is on the cover of the um, Arcadia book there, and he just took a break. So Hoover came over, got his gun, got liquored up, went over to the Fair Play Hotel, walked up to the counter, shot the guy right, you know, point blank range. So um, Hoover was taken down to Denver for what they called safekeeping, which was really so he didn't get lynched. And so he was in Denver jail for a year. They brought him back to Fair Play. He had his trial, but all of his witnesses had disappeared. So they made what we called a plea deal, plea bargain, for eight years in prison for a murder. Well, the townsfolk in Fair Play didn't much like that. And so when Hoover uh, received his sentence, he walked out of the courtroom smiling and nodding to his friends like, yeah, I got off, you know, I got eight years. Well, that night about 50 men um, went over to the sheriff's house in Fair Play, got the sheriff out of bed, demanded the jail keys, got the jail keys, hauled Hoover out of the jail, and strung him up out that courthouse window, which still stands, you know. So, yeah, all true, all true story. No, nobody was uh, held to blame. <laughs> no, for that. no, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The murderers of the murderers. Exactly, exactly. And so what the, what the vigilantes did was they put rocks in their mouth to like disguise their voices, so they mumbled. <laughs> and they had bandanas, I, you know. I mean, I can just picture it. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's one of the more, um, you know, visual ones, I think, simply because the courthouse still stands and the window is still there, and, you know, the whole bit, so. Anyway, yes. Um, they did. Yeah, they didn't have probation. They had parole. And actually, I was a probation officer in uh, Colorado. Probation and parole are still separate, and they have very different duties. So, as a probation officer, I was under the judicial branch of government. Parole is under the executive branch, and parole has a lot of a lot more power. They carry guns. They can do a warrantless arrest little known fact. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but they did have parole and a, a couple of my characters were paroled. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh-huh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.